Welcome to the Holistic Accountant Podcast. The aim of this podcast is to demonstrate how valuable tax and business advice is when we take a holistic approach. That is, all tax and business advice that your holistic accountant gives you must be aimed at helping you achieve your business and lifestyle goals. It's not just about saving tax. In this episode, we'd like to discuss how to prepare your business for sale. That is, how to maximize your sale value after tax. Welcome, Mina. Hi, Stuart. So there's many reasons why you might want to get your business ready for sale. Now, the obvious one clearly is that you plan to sell your business. You know, some people plan to um, start a business, build it, and then sell it for um, hopefully a, a large payday. And that's part of their sort of strategy to build their personal wealth or even transition into retirement. So for those people, this podcast podcast topic is a pretty obvious one. But there's other reasons that you um, might want to sort of focus on uh, maximizing the saleability of your business. And the first one is succession planning. So, you know, if you're in a business um, and you're you're occupying a key role in that business um, and you want to attract uh, someone else that might come and, you know, buy part of the business off you or even uh, potentially all the business down the track, um, there's going to be two reasons why someone uh, might contemplate doing that. The first one is um, that they love the business, uh, the product that they've worked in the business, that they have some sort of uh, sweat equity, you know, that they become a, a key person of that business. Uh, the second reason would be it's a very good profitable business. You know, some people that are silent partners, for example, might be attracted to investing in a business just because the financial returns are good. And, and my view is why not make it both? If you if you need to come up with a succession plan, um, then of course you need to identify the right per- person that can slot into the business for you. But if you can then make that business um, very investable, you know, it's going to give good quality um, financial returns, then I think it's going to be a lot easier to implement a succession plan. The second reason might be because you want to reduce your working hours. So you might not want to retire in full, um, but maybe you don't want to work as much as you currently are. So you want to have a plan, you want to put in place a plan where you might go down to maybe two or three days a week, for example, and you might be comfortable to do that for a, a lot longer period of time than working, say, five days a week. Well, uh, making yourself redundant in your own business uh, is a very important way to go about doing that, um, which is some of the things that we're going to talk about here. And lastly, maybe just because it makes good sense. You know, if you can build a sustainable business that isn't single point sensitive on one individual, such as yourself, um, uh, then you prepare yourself for any changes down the track, whether they're industry changes or changes to your um, per- personal situation or even changes to your goals. So it's okay. We might be sitting here thinking today, I'd love to work in my business for the rest of my life. Uh, and then I don't even think beyond that. But, you know, of course, in, in a couple of years time, you might wake up and uh, not feel as enthused to do that. Now, if you've worked hard at um, making sure that your business isn't reliant upon you, uh, then you've got that flexibility down the track. And sure, the thing to remember is that taking steps to prepare a business for sale typically makes it a more robust business. So it's good to do it irrespectively. So there are a few key steps you must focus on. The first is you need to identify a buyer. Make sure you have something to sell that is attractive to your likely buyer. Having a clear idea of who will be the likely buyer, the reasons they will buy your business and the things they are looking for will help you get your business ready for sale. You also need to reduce key person reliance. Often small businesses small businesses are heavily reliant on the net, on their owner. But unless you're willing to sell yourself, that's not a good thing. <laughs> Therefore, you must make yourself redundant. Typically, you can do that by, a, for example, attracting great team members or focusing on systemization. This could take many, many years. And that's why thinking about saleability sooner rather than later is a good idea. Systemization is also critical where there is less reliance on the people to deliver the business outcomes. Anyone can be a good, anyone can do, oh, sorry anyone can drive a good robust system. McDonald's is an excellent example of this. Their business is run by 15, 16, 17 year olds. They don't make the best burgers in town, but they are certainly consistent. And consistency builds trust and reputation. It shouldn't be underestimated. It's almost better to be consistently average than inconsistently brilliant. 
the McDonald's example, Mina, is a good one. Anyone that has uh, teenage children would um, greatly appreciate how difficult it is to get them to do anything, let alone get them to do something on a consistently uh, on a consistent basis. So it, it really speaks to the strength of their internal systems and something I think we all, um, no matter what our product or service is, we all can kind of learn from. The last two things we need to really focus on is uh, legal protection and contracts. Uh, so things like making sure we've got customer contracts. So if we've got uh, particularly large customers, if we can uh, tie them up in a, a contractual agreement uh, to deliver a certain amount and, and provide some incentives to do that. Obviously, it reduces the risk of a potential purchaser. Same with supplier agreements uh, to, to um, keep a cap on or at least manage um, uh, the cost of, cost of goods. Uh, leases, uh, particularly if you've got, uh, you know, occupy a premises that, that is really valuable, if it has uh, some goodwill associated with that um, premises, uh, then you want to have leases and options in place. Um, and really anything that you can do to reduce a purchaser's risk. Uh, if you've got intellectual property, thinking about patents, copyright, trademarks, these sorts of legal protections. So really just the basics of, of legal due diligence, if you like, and you know, a, a good lawyer can sort of walk you through some of those things that you need to be considering. And the last one, Mina, is to clean up sort of financial results uh, and, and uh, statements. Uh, so the first one is sort of cleaning up balance sheet, uh, you know, if you've got any uh, liabilities or assets that are, you know, related parties, so to, to yourself or other entities in your group, um, then you might want to get them off the balance sheet. Um, writing off uh, unsaleable stock, uh, minimising employee entitlements, you know, just making sure that the balance sheet looks as strong and as, a clean, as clean as possible. And then uh, finally, uh, the profit and loss statement. Of course, it makes sense. You want to make that look as uh, strong and consistent and predictable as possible. Uh, so, uh, again, focusing on making sure that we're maximising margins and we've got a, a strong focus on minimising costs as well uh, and uh, improving the consistency. So if we can... Um, uh, show that there's less volatility in earnings uh, and particularly in revenue, um, then that's going to um, uh, you know, g- give some comfort to a potential purchaser. And maximising your sale price is one thing, but let's talk about something a bit more interesting, minimising tax. Yes, of course. <laughs> the whole reason for this podcast. Exactly. <laughs> so you need to consider whether you're eligible, or firstly, you need to consider whether you're eligible to apply to small business capital gains concessions. If so, it's possible you could reduce your capital gains liability to zero. This can be done by applying various discounts and then making a contribution into super, which isn't a bad idea anyway. The small business concessions are very complex, so it's a good idea to get specific advice, but the key eligibility criteria is that the group's aggregated revenue must be less than $2 million per annum. That includes your affiliated businesses, and your net worth cannot, be, cannot exceed $6 million. If you cannot avail yourself of the small business uh, capital gains concessions, then your business ownership structure is even more critical in helping you minimise your CGT or your capital gains tax. You really need to ensure you have structured your business well to utilise the full benefits of a family trust and a corporate beneficiary. Those small CGT concessions are certainly um, very attractive, uh, particularly for people that are selling their business and then transitioning into retirement uh, because it it allows you to potentially shift some money inside super, which is a a nice tax-free environment and a lot of uh, self-employed people uh, really tend to have lower super balances than uh, POYG employees. Uh, And there's very few things in life that are tax-free, Mina, so... Um, one to certainly take into account. And if you can um, navigate, uh, you know, your business sales so that you fall inside those uh, concessions, uh, it, it's a, a very valuable, uh, valuable outcome. Now, of course, like many other things, there's lots of other uh, considerations to take into account other than just getting your business ready for sale and then maximizing or minimizing tax and therefore maximizing the after-tax uh, Uh, proceeds. Um, There's a a few points that Mina and I just want to sort of touch on and highlight, but of course it's it's important to get advice from your holistic accountant because everyone's situation is different and there's there's also different risks and opportunities and you really need to lean on that experience. Uh, But the first one to try and maximize uh, sale revenue, sometimes we can offer a purchaser and 
uh, what's called an earnout clause. Uh, so that means that they will agree to um, pay you a certain price, and and particularly if you want to, you know, we all want a full price, but if you really want the highest mul- uh, multiple possible, then one way to deliver that or get that um, is to reduce the vendor's risk. And you might say, look, the vendor will pay four or five times profit, um, but we'll pay eighty percent of that upfront. Um, and we'll pay the remaining 20% in 12 or 18 months' time, assuming that you still hit the profitability marks that you've indicated where the business is at. Uh, And this would be particularly valuable if you were continuing to work in the business. In fact, I probably wouldn't consider it unless I was working in the business. Uh, And what it does is it means you then have an incentive to help the the new owner transition into the business and and maintain its profitability. Um, so earnouts can be uh, very valuable in maximising your sale value. Um, uh, the next one is how are you going to get paid uh, for the business? Um, so obviously cash is a, is an obvious one and certainly the the least risky one. But again, uh, if you want to look or look at ways to sort of maximise. Uh, your purchase price, then not everyone's necessarily going to be able to stump up the cash. Uh, and they might be willing to pay a higher price if it's a, a equity a script and cash co- combination. So that means that you either get um, equity or shares in the new business uh, and particularly can be um, an attractive option if it's a listed business too because then you've got uh, an open market and where you can eventually sell those shares uh, when you're able to. Uh, Now I've seen lots of situations where people have worked really hard all their life and sold their business for um, shares, what's called sold it for script. even for listed businesses, and then the share price um, uh, bottoms out, crashes, and they end up uh, getting very little money for their business at the end of the day. So just be careful uh, about what you're... I mean, cash is king, uh, and if you're receiving equity or some shares as compensation, uh, just make friends with the possibility that, you know, by the time it comes to uh, potentially selling their own market, it could be worth uh, a lot less. Uh, the last one is vendor finance, which means that you really fund the loan. Uh, so, for example, they might pay you 80% in cash uh, and 20% is vendor financed. And they would pay you, uh, it's it's really a, a loan from you to them, and they would pay you an interest rate with some sort of repayment terms over the time. Uh, vendor financing would probably be more common in a situation where um, you've got a succession plan. I was uh, searching for that, Mina, for a while. Uh, a succession plan in place, uh, particularly if you're selling to someone that's already in your business that's going to take an equity share, they might not necessarily have the the finances to be able to pay uh, pay cash. But thinking very carefully about, you know, if you're going to sell, what sort of um, uh, compensation or consideration will you receive for that sale price? There's just a couple of other factors I'd like to touch base on, Stuart. Um, The first is vendor warranties and representations. Um, Purchasers will want to reduce as much risk as possible by requesting you make certain promises about the health of the business. You must ensure you understand these and the associated risks. Having a a well-informed solicitor who's um, experienced in commercial trade is really important in these instances. The second is restraints of trade, a promise that you will not complete or sorry I should say compete with the mm. business within a certain time period or and or uh, ge- geographical region this is obviously not very important if you plan to retire in you know completely so getting your business ready for sale is a very uh, valuable activity and one that you know people should start thinking about sooner rather than later and there's a few things as we've spoken about or touched on in this podcast that you need to do uh, that can take a few years to you know get all lined up and implemented correctly uh, your holistic accountant is integral uh, to making sure that you're going to maximise your business value. And they can bring in other professionals as and when required, uh, including uh, legal practitioners, uh, business brokers, merger and acquisition advisors, uh, those sorts of people. But really making sure that you've got a really robust business that's systemized, that isn't highly dependent on you, the the, the owner, the one individual, um, it goes a, a very long way to sort of maximising business value. So thank you very much for listening to this episode and, in fact, hopefully the entire series of eight episodes. Um, We hope you very much uh, enjoyed it. Um, We will record a second series if it's popular, so please leave a rating or feedback wherever you listen to your podcast. 
Um, and if it sounds uh, interesting uh, or useful to anyone else that you might know, we'd really appreciate you sharing. Um, and of course, if there's enough interest, uh, we will do a second season. Uh, thanks very much, Mina. Thanks, Stuart. Bye for now.